I'm Jake, I'm from State Scoop, um, and uh, super excited to be here with, with all of you today. Uh, it's funny when Derek said Jake from State Scoop, uh, whenever I'm at a conference that is full of people, yeah, I think you can see where this is going. Uh, I get Jake from State Farm. Uh, I, I can confirm that I do not work for State Farm, uh, but I do get a royalty check every time that commercial airs. <laughs> not sure what's going on there. Uh, so that, that's a joke. I don't. I'm, I'm going to make a lot of bad jokes, man. Like it's not going to be good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I'm I'm Jake. I'm, I, I lead the State Scoop team. I'm going to talk tonight about. Uh, what we're doing and why uh, industry press and the work that we do might set a standard for how media looks in the future. So here's the plans. So here's what we're going to do. This is I'm not going to read this. This is the this is the flow of the presentation. We're going to do the presentation and then we're going to be done with the presentation and it's going to be great. Uh, so who am I? What is State Scoop and uh, and why am I here? These these are all these are all great questions. Uh, so so I'm Jake. Uh, State Scoop is the leading online media company focused on state and local government and technology. Uh, we have Joel on the live stream, our number one fan, and we have a few folks in the audience who are interested in what we're doing. So already we're off to the races. Uh, I'm here because Shy Hack not invited me, uh, but also because I, I think that hopefully you'll find that what we're doing at Scoop News Group, which is our parent company, uh, kind of cool. So who am I? Uh, I'm from a small town, uh, so, so Chicago is a big city, uh, and I'm <laughs> not from a big city. Uh, I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania uh, called Matamoros, Pennsylvania. It's got about 2,200 residents. We don't have a stoplight. The, net, the first stoplight is outside of town. So you leave the town and you get to a stoplight and you're outside of the town. Uh, I'm publicly educated. So I went to all public school my, my whole uh, education career. Uh, I went to Delaware Valley High School, not that that matters to anybody. And then the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And yes, it is as confusing as it sounds. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's named after a state, but it's not in Indiana. It's in Pennsylvania. Uh, but that's a public school in Pennsylvania. I got a degree in journalism. Uh, I have nearly a decade of experience covering government and technology. Uh, which kind of scares me a little bit. I feel like I'm still 20, and I'm, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've covered uh, a bunch of stuff. I covered the White House uh, under the Obama administration, specifically the founding and the creation of the US Digital Service, uh, which is relevant to, to folks in this room. Uh, I covered Congress a little bit. I covered uh, the FAA uh, when the uh, notice for proposed rulemaking about drones came out. So that was kind of a big moment, a little techie, but you know, fun. Uh, and I covered my favorite job that I've covered so far is the US Postal Service. Uh, I covered the, the pre-funding debacle and the financial troubles that the Postal Service was facing uh, before you knew about them in 2020. <laughs> I covered it in like 2014, uh, and it was, it was scary then, and it's even scarier now. So uh, this is not about the Postal Service, but if you want to find me after and talk about the Postal Service, I'm so ready. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, in about 2015, 2016, I pivoted to covering state and local government and higher education. Specifically, how IT offices within state and local governments uh, do their jobs and how they do or don't uh, serve all of you. So uh, I lead State Scoop and EdScoop. Now I'm the VP of Content and Community. That's a long title to just say that I oversee the editorial operations of the sites and I work inside of Scoop News Group with our events and our sales team to direct all of the activity that we do externally. Uh, so that's what I do. And I live in Urbana, which is why I'm physically here. Uh, I live in Urbana, Illinois, just a two and a half hour train ride south. Uh, so thanks Amtrak. Uh, not postal service, but you're close. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the laughs. We can keep them going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so State Scoop, we're the leading online news site focused on state and local government and technology. Uh, we launched in 2013, so 2023 is our 10 year anniversary. In fact, we just passed it a couple weeks ago, so happy birthday, uh, State Scoop. Uh, we spun out of Fed Scoop, which you may or may not have heard about, but uh, as the name would imply, covers the intersection of federal government and IT. Uh, and we're part of Scoop News Group, and we have other publications Scoop is the theme. Ed Scoop, Cyber Scoop, Work Scoop, and Defense Scoop. Uh, so you can probably figure out what those are all about. Uh, our, our main job uh, as, as State Scoop is, is building community among CIOs, CTOs, CISOs, so Chief Information Officers, Chief Technology Officers, Chief Information Security Officers, uh, and other tech leaders across all 50 states, uh, the top 25 cities by population, and the top 10 counties also by population. That's not to say that we don't cover anything other than those things, uh, but you know it's a big world out there and we had to pick some spots to focus on. So we, we will cover things that are not included in that list, but, uh, but that's our core, that's what we look at every single day. Uh, we're traditionally and generally focused on central IT. Uh, so think about you know, your, your office of the chief information officer, uh, that central IT office in a city or a state, 
Uh, in Illinois, it's the Department of Innovation and Technology. Uh, in Chicago, uh, it's a little complicated, uh, but it's it's in. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's somewhere. Uh, and, and so we, uh, we're focused on them. Uh, but we're also, as we grow and expand, uh, we're expanding into the technology elements of public safety, health and human services, and more. Uh, we're a small team. We've got, we've got four reporters and editors on my team uh, that work for me and work with me, uh, and we cover the entire country. So inevitably, we're, we're not getting everything, uh, but we're trying to get as much as, as we can. So that's, that's State Scoop. This is just a little bit of a look at what we cover. Uh, specifically, you know, topic-wise. So uh, about almost a quarter of our coverage is on cybersecurity, uh, which probably is not a surprise to, to most of you as, as cybersecurity is one of the, the dominant topics of our time when it comes to technology. Uh, we also cover personnel, like who's coming, who's going, uh, who's leading, who's not leading. Uh, back office IT, think of your IT modernization, your cloud computing, your network stuff, uh, all, of, all of that kind of wonky IT stuff is, is a still a core focus of our coverage. Of course, broadband is an, incre is an increasingly uh, large area of coverage for us with the federal funding uh, that's going into broadband right now. Uh, and then emerging tech, things like AI, uh, I don't know that it's quite emerging, but we kind of classify it under that for classification purposes. AI, RPA, robotic process automation, uh, machine learning is the same similar thing. Uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, another big area in, under, that, under that umbrella. Uh, data and analytics, and of course, 46%, almost half of our coverage is all this other stuff that doesn't fit neatly under those uh, criteria. This, this graph here on the right is sort of our traffic uh, year over year. So since we launched 10 years ago, you can see that we've just sort of been on a pretty steep incline. Uh, and so you know, I'm, I'm proud of that, but it's also to show that what we're doing is working and uh, we're getting some large momentum that has now made us the leading GovTech media uh, company. So two thirds of our annual traffic, this is year over year, this is uh, pretty much across all 10 years uh, that we've existed, uh, two thirds of our annual traffic is on new content. So you know the, the, the stuff that's coming out right now, you can go to statescoop.com right now and see four or five stories that just came out today. Uh, that's two thirds of our, of our traffic year over year is that kind of content. Uh, and on, on average, we're growing about 65% year over year, uh, traffic growth over the last decade. Our revenue model is a little interesting. Um, and it's sort of what I'm going to talk about tonight, not necessarily just the revenue, but what makes us a little bit different. So you heard a couple weeks ago from uh, SEMA, and you, they talked a little bit about how the, the traditional revenue model in journalism is failing. And is, is failing journalists, it's failing media outlets, and more importantly, it's failing communities. And so what we do is, is a little bit different. So we have digital advertising, and that's nice. We make some money from that. But a, a large percentage of our revenue comes from events. So these are opportunities where we bring people together online and in person to talk about these trends and these things that are, that are happening in our community. And big companies and small companies <laughs> sponsor these events uh, and, and join us for these conversations, but have almost no influence over who's there, who, what the content is, and, uh, and what happens at those events. And, and, and really, we're, we're monetizing on, conv on convening and bringing the right people into the room every single time, uh, which is a little bit of a shift compared to you know, your traditional print media who you know, they sell advertising and that's pretty much it. Uh, so, so we're trying to do things a little bit differently. We have another, a couple of other products in, in how we monetize and make money. Again, my, product, my, my presentation is not necessarily about our revenue model, but my point is that we've prioritized delivering content and building community uh, in a way that works for you and not making sure that we're profitable, right? We're, we, we are profitable, we, we pay our bills, but our goal is to serve you all and to serve our communities instead of to, to you know, make buku bucks down the line. Uh, we do this through a couple of other, uh, other things. So in addition to our daily content, we do annual awards programs that are entirely community driven. Uh, this is intentional. We, we don't think that we're anybody. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we know about this stuff, but, but you all, the people in the communities, know more than we do about pretty much everything. I, just listening to the three word intros, uh, all of you in, in know a lot more than I do about a lot of things. Uh, and so I'm not gonna pretend that we do know about it. And so that's kind of our philosophy with things like awards programs. It's also our philosophy with things like events. Um, State Scoop in particular, our, our Fed Scoop brand does a lot of in-person events in DC. That's where our company is headquartered. Uh, but State Scoop, we do two virtual events per year, and we may or may not have some things to announce soon about some in-person events coming to a uh, place near you. That's a hint. Uh, and, uh, and then we also do some things that are a little less newsy, 
things like, you know, here's what your IT leaders read uh, over the, the summer at the beach, or, you know, here's their New Year's resolutions for the year ahead. Uh, and, and really, again, thinking about community first and not necessarily just getting the news out. We also have a weekly podcast. It's called the Priorities Podcast. I happen to host that podcast, uh, but it's it's fine. I think it's good. I hope you enjoy it. If you listen, uh, if you don't, that's okay too. Uh, but you know, you'll if you like this, then you'll love that because <laughs> it's this voice just like reading a script. So <laughs> that's that's that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the state of of media. So again, I'm I'm here because I think what we're doing at State Scoop and Scoop News Group is really cool. Uh, but it, it comes at a time where there is a, a very large amount of distrust in, in media. And I, I don't have my notes uh, in front of me in this view, so it doesn't really matter. But somewhere around 30% uh, of people, uh, to only, only about 30% of people trust the news media. And that means a lot of things. That can mean everything from your New York Times to your Washington Posts. It can mean smaller, more community-focused outlets. But, but in general, the idea of the media you know that Bob's Burgers sketch in the pilot? They're like, hello, the media? It's that one. Uh, that's the, thank you. Uh, uh, that's the, the distrust that we're talking about, right? So, so about 30% of people trust that. Uh, that means 70% of people don't, uh, which is a huge, huge problem. How many of you, if I just say the media, raise your hands, how many of you trust it? It's not a trick question. You can, it's, it's okay. So we got a few hands. So that's probably about 30%. Uh, it's actually probably less in this room. But you know, the, the bottom line is media as we know it is failing us. Um, studies are showing that, people are showing that. Uh, I, I think our discourse is showing that. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how this can be different. So why does this matter to you? One, you're, you're, you're a consumer, right? By, by being a human that exists on planet Earth, presumably using the internet, uh, you're consuming content, you're consuming media. Therefore, you know, the state of media and how well media is doing matters to, to you. Uh, and, and the internet, you know, the internet has really lowered the barrier to entry for media, meaning a lot of people can say whatever the heck they want to say. Uh, but, but it also has added risk, right? We can't validate things as easily as we once could. Uh, I mean, not... I don't know that we actually could validate things, but uh, <laughs> there, there's there's more risk inherent in this in this process. Um, but but you as a as a civic hacking group, people attending a civic hacking event, you you are more engaged than sort of the average consumer that media likes to talk about, considering that you're here, you got here, you found the way here, uh, and you're participating in civic hacking. So trying to make your systems, your governments, uh, your communities work better for you. Um, so, you, so you're more engaged, but but this does present some challenges because if, if if media is not trusted, you know, other than your own channels, media will largely shape the perception of whatever work you do here or otherwise. So even if you don't trust the media, the media is telling your story, and so who's going to trust your story if it's being told by something that no one trusts? You see this loop, this loop of of distrust uh, that's going forward. So without a mouthpiece. Right. If you if you're not going to use this 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 media because this is the trusted or not trusted thing, without a mouth mouthpiece, uh, your community your work is happening in a bubble, and you know it might be really great in this room, but no one outside this room knows about it, and that creates exclusion. And we're already in a society that is dominated by exclusion from from all kinds of different things, uh, and and you know the list is is very long, uh, but but you know without using this mouthpiece without using media to tell your story, uh, that's all happening without you. And the good work that you're doing in rooms like this is not making it out to the public. And so the point that I'm here to make to you and the point that I think we're working toward at State Scoop is that community is, is everything, right? So this is a community right here, right here in this room. This is a civic hacking community. Um, you know, communities drive everything in our lives. They're our interests, right? You might be a, a, an active birder Maybe you like to bird. I, does anybody bird? There we go, we got a birder. Uh, so we have a member of the birding community here. Uh, you might be a stand-up comedy fan, right? Okay, great. So you're in a community with stand-up comics. You might be a part of a certain neighborhood, right? So I'm in, I live in East Urbana, historic East Urbana. Uh, so I'm part of the historic East Urbana Facebook group, I mean community. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that's a, a, an example of, of a small community. Political parties, right? We, we, we love politics. Um, that, that was sarcastic. Uh, you know, you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green Party, uh, anarchist, big communities, right? And, and big groups of people. So, uh, 
all of these communities exist. And I think one of the things that society in general, but, but media has tried to do is say, okay, we're gonna be your one-stop shop. We're, we're gonna be your resource for everything. And I don't think it works. <laughs> the, the New York Times doesn't care about historic East Urbana or birders, uh, except for like once. Uh, and, and they don't really care about events like this, but, but they serve everything to everyone. But community does. This room cares about that. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that community news, with community news sources, equal audience. So in journalism, how, how many people, anybody, any journalists in here? Anybody? Fantastic. Journalists are great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in journalism, you know, we, 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 we live or die by our sources, right? It's, it's in DC, it's, it's how you do or do not get jobs. Uh, in, you know, in communities, it's, it's how, you, how connected or unconnected you are with the places that you're covering. And so in community news, uh, sources and your audience are the same people. Right? The people reading your sites are the same people that you're talking to to populate your sites. And there are some pluses and minuses to this, but, but I, I want to talk about the positive side of it for a second. And that is that you're creating content that people are hyper engaged with, that people are really excited to be a part of because it's directly relevant to them. So if I do an interview tomorrow with Derek and put it on the Priorities podcast, that's a plug, uh, you can listen to that and you, you're more likely to listen to it because it's someone you know and it's a community that you're a part of, right? But if I interview some random Joe Schmo uh, on the street and put it on my podcast, you probably skip that one this week, right? Uh, and so, so the idea here is that these hyper-engaged communities need sources of truth. They need these, these mouthpieces to tell their stories and so, one of the things that we're working on with State Scoop is we're a national publication. I told you, 50 states, 20 cities, some 10 counties, and everything in between. And we're treating it like it's a community newspaper. I, I, I very intentionally explained that I am from a town of 2,200 people uh, at the beginning because in my hometown, everything lives and dies by that community newspaper. It's called the Pike County Dispatch. It comes out every Wednesday, but really gets distributed Monday night. I don't understand it, uh, but, but it's out. And, and really, like that's your main source of gossip. That's your main source of news about what's happening in the town. And why should a national community of technology-interested people who are adjacent to or in government, why should that be any different? Just because we're not geographically all together, we can tell stories that are relevant to a community. We can tell stories that are relevant to communities like this one. And so when everything is local, everyone sort of has to care <laughs> because it's directly relevant to, to them. So like I said, we, we operate like a community newspaper, not a business to business outlet. That's what B2B means. Uh, you know, this is a B2B, think of like every industry in the world has some sort of publication that caters to like the ins and outs and shit that no one else cares about. Like, you know, uh, Streets Monthly probably covers, oh, this asphalt, this is the good asphalt. You gotta get on this asphalt. Uh, or, or Birders, Birders Monthly. We're really into this, this type of binoculars. You know, we're really into this, this is the right binocular. Uh, and so, you know, that, that they all operate with a sort of a thing where they're chasing revenue, they're chasing advertising dollars, they're chasing the big vendors in their community. Uh, but, but we're trying to approach this a little bit differently. So we understand and acknowledge that you all are our audience, and you all are so, you all are also our sources. So, uh, if there's something going on, which I'm sure there is in Chicago IT, you know you should know that you can come to someone like me and trust that my team and and our publication, our community resource, is going to help you tell your story and is going to help tell the story about what's actually happening on the ground in these communities. We approach this, like I said, with quality over quantity. So. You know, like I said, we have four people covering the entire country. There, there's, there's no way that we're going to hit everything. It's just, it's just impossible. And even if we were four times the size as we are now, there's still no way that we can hit everything. And so we focus on telling really specific stories that matter to really specific audiences. And, and the goal is that the more that we do that, the more that we expand, the more readership expands, the more revenue expands, the more people we can add, and the more we can reach. It's, it's a very, very basic business model, it's a very basic revenue model for something that has become overcomplicated in media over, over the years. The, the goal for what we're doing is, is becoming that natural part of your daily experience. Like 70%, nah, it's too high, sorry. <laughs> like 60% of State Scoop's daily traffic 
happens on the browser on a desktop computer, which is kind of insane. But if you think about it, where, where are you going to read about government IT? Well, probably when you sit down at work and do a government IT job, right? So, so that's a huge focus for us is making sure that we're that daily resource, we're part of that day, we're part of that ecosystem. Uh, and then most importantly, that we're creating a forum for conversation. Uh, and, and specifically, not just telling the news, not just getting out there and telling stories, but being accountable, right? I, I, I hope and fully expect that after tonight, all of you will be blowing up my inbox, telling me how we can be better. And that's how this is supposed to work. You're, I'm supposed to be reachable. People who do this work are supposed to be reachable. So I want to be accountable. I want to be accessible, right? I want you to know that when you email me or when you text me or you call me or LinkedIn message me, that that message, if I ignored your LinkedIn message, I'm so sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, that that message doesn't go unread, right? It, it gets to me and, and something can happen because of it. Uh, and specifically, approachable. I, I'm here talking about why I think what we're doing is really cool and really interesting, but I have no pretensions that what we're doing is the best ever or is the right thing. We are constantly growing, constantly changing, constantly getting better. And that's what we need in a community. There's a feedback loop. And so we need community to come back to us and tell us what we're doing well and what we're not. Um, again, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Our business model is designed to protect what you need. You need information. You need news. You need access. We, we're designed to protect that. Uh, and, and we focus on community. We focus on people. We tell people stories, in addition to technology stories. Uh, and we focus on giving visibility to things that are not necessarily visible. So whether that's a wonky government IT project gone awry, or whether that's a, a particular up and comer in some agency somewhere that's doing something really cool that we can make sure that they get their story told and that people can tell their story. And specifically, we do this, as my, my boss likes to say, by telling the good stories, the bad stories, and everything in between. Uh, so, so just because we're coming at this from a community-focused mindset does not mean that we don't tell bad stories. It doesn't mean that you know, things are not are put on, on display for people to realize that this might not be going as well as we think. Uh, that's part of a community. We have hard conversations with each other. We tell each other what's happening. Here's an, a good example of some localized stories on the left left, uh, left, you know, this is a good, good story, right? Chicago CIO modernizing the city's technology. Uh, in the middle, it's truly a, an, an in-between story. This is just, we're, we're appointing some new leadership to, to lead a digital, uh, digital strategy. And then on the right, somewhat of a bad story, somewhat of a controversial story. In that, in that deck of that story, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's proposal would merge the city's IT agency with the department that manages vehicles and buildings, which the city's former chief data officer called a terrible decision. Our job is to make sure that you have that information and to know what's going on. Yes, the IT office in Chicago is currently in a department uh, that manages vehicles and buildings, and now also IT. Uh, and and we're, our job is to give visibility to that and let you decide whether that's good or bad. Why does this work? And why is it a little tricky? So we, I, as the person who's in front of you, uh, remain accessible, accountable, and approachable to our audience. Again, I, I really, really want to hear from you. I really want to know you know, what we can be doing better. There, there are so many areas that I know we can be doing better, and I'm happy to talk about all of that with you. Um, but, but being accessible, accountable, and approachable is super, super important to me personally, and super important to us as a, as a member of these communities. Uh, and again, when everything is local, everything is local. People know each other. You know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> and as I say here, sometimes people get upset. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, you know, my publication or myself personally has written a story that pissed someone off. And either that person iced me out and didn't talk to me, or I went to an event and they came up and told me exactly what they thought about that piece. And at the end of the day, I'm always here to listen. And, and, and any good reporter, any good editor, any good publisher needs to be there to listen. We do things because we, you know, have principles, we have ethics, we have reasons that we, we operate. We, there are tools of the trade in journalism. But there, there's no reason that journalists, editors, publishers cannot be accessible and reachable to talk about those things. And at the very least, listen. But at the very most, maybe we got it wrong. <laughs> maybe we should be telling the story a, a little bit differently. Uh, we know as much as you tell us or announce. This is true. I, Joel from Cook County is, is listening. You know, Joel is, is, is one of the more proactive communicators in county government. 
Uh, Cook County will put out a story about how they're modernizing a phone system. No one else cares about that but us. So <laughs> that's great, and we're appreciative of that. But also, like, our reporters will look into places like Cook County and say, hey, this isn't working so well, or maybe this is working really well. And, and again, sometimes people get upset. Sometimes we get upset. We, we're growing in real time. We make mistakes. I'm, I've probably made 6,000 mistakes just talking right now, uh, and we're going to make a lot more. But again, being accessible, approachable, and accountable to all of these things is what's going to make community news really essential going forward. Let's talk about what media could, maybe should be, uh, again, in, in and not in the context of state scoop. Obviously, number one is factual. <laughs> uh, there, there is a lot of debate about what are facts, uh, except there's not debate because facts are facts. Uh, and, and we need to strip as much opinion as possible. That's true. But I would encourage you all to think about this, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know that I have a whole lot to say on it at this moment, but the idea of journalists as fully objective bystanders, if we're really being honest with ourselves, is that possible? I don't, I don't think it is. And I think that's okay. But I think we have to acknowledge it and we have to talk about it. And again, that goes back to being accessible and approachable and accountable, is that we need to be called on our shit when we need to be. So that's, that's a big part of it as well. Decentralized. I talked about communities. I talked about all the birders, shy hack night, government IT, right? Communities and communities. Uh, maybe one size doesn't fit all when it comes to media. Maybe each individual community needs its own news source. We follow, uh, how many of you on social media? You, you hear about the social media thing? Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, probably, you probably follow hundreds, sometimes thousands of accounts on social media. I don't know why we've sort of gotten away from this idea that we only get one news source. Why, why shouldn't there be community news sources for everything that you care about? And just like you follow people on social media, that's part of your, your digestion of the news. Local and focused is, is essential, right? One of, the, one of the things that they teach us in journalism school is that locality is one of the central news pegs of a story, right? How, how close is it to the community that you're covering? What does it matter to those people? The more wide you get, the broader you get, the more mainstream you get, the harder that piece gets. And so why should it be that way? Why can't we be local? Why can't we write directly for the people that this matters for? Community focused, I've said that word a lot, always. Uh, and specifically, this is a big one. Again, responsive. Uh, we should be demanding that our media is responsive to us. Uh, and, and we should be demanding that our media does a good job and a better job and an increasingly better job of covering the things that we care about. What does that mean for the future of us? Uh, as we grow, we're continuing to you know, work on our flexible and scalable revenue model, and we want to theoretically have a scoop in every place. There should be a Chicago scoop. There should be an Illinois scoop. All of these things should work together. And, and really focus on exactly what you know. When you go to statescoop.com, uh, other than the fact that we cover local government, <laughs> you know exactly what you're getting. Uh, and that should be really important too as, as we continue to scale. Again, accessibility and engagement for all. Uh, news, your New York Times, uh, is not necessarily accessible. It's not necessarily engaging to a, a, a focused audience. Uh, we are not behind a paywall and we never will be. Uh, media does not need to be behind a paywall to be profitable. That's true. Um, and, and really, you know, we want to create safe spaces for people to tell their stories, both on and off the record. So you know, if, if one of you pulls me aside here and tells me about some bad stuff going on somewhere, uh, you should know that you have trust in me and that we can tell that story either publicly or not. And that's OK, too, because knowledge, especially in the hands of a journalist who, who does what I'm just talking about, uh, is power. And it gives us some opportunities to, to expose some things that, that, might not be, that might not be visible. It also allows us to have a more robust, set of, more robust set of contributors and more diverse perspectives. This is something that we will probably never be as good at as we need to be. Uh, and we need to keep striving every single day to include more people in the conversation, to find more ways for people to tell their stories. You know, one of the things that, that makes a lot of people in media successful is that they just ask for stuff. And yet when we get these jobs, we think that we're beyond that. And, and this is not the case. So I want you to, to reach out to me if you're interested in contributing to something like StateScoop, if you're interested in being a part of something like this. And, and it's our job to be responsive to that and to be reachable and to, sh to highlight these perspectives. 
And so what does this mean going forward? One, tell us your stories. Anything at the intersection of state government, local government, IT, anything there, that's directly in our wheelhouse. So if you have something to talk about, tell us, share it with us. That's how we can help elevate that in this community. Outside of that, find or create platforms to tell your own stories. Don't rely on this, this idea of media to, to save you, this, this mainstream media concept that we've gotten into. It's, it's not going to be the future. And even, even if, you know, I, I wish the New York Times must, much success. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, we all need to be finding and demanding better from our communities and better from our news. And so I encourage you to do the same. Um, and again, demand more from the media that you do have, regardless of size. Whether you're a four-person publication like State Scoop, or whether you're a thousands of person publication like the New York Times, demand more of them, expect more of them, encourage them to, to serve you better. And then lastly, journalists are people too. <laughs> uh, just because someone has a name on a byline doesn't mean that they don't have a story, doesn't mean that they don't care about you. Uh, they need to be reachable, they need to be talked to, because otherwise they lose perspective of what matters to community. And so that's, hmm, see, talk to them. <laughs> no, no one is unreachable, including a cat, I think. <laughs> uh, so that's the, the core of my talk. Couple things to plug, uh, one, we have a virtual cybersecurity modernization summit on March 2nd. Uh, if you're interested in cybersecurity and government or higher education, tune into that. Uh, and I hope that a lot of what I'm talking about here today will be reflected in the type of content that you see in that event. And, and if it's not, I want you to tell me uh, as well. Uh, and then I talked about awards programs. Right now, our State Scoop 50 Awards, these are community-driven awards programs for state government. If you know of someone in state government who's doing a really great job and not being recognized for it, I encourage you to nominate them for a State Scoop 50 Award. We have four categories. If you need information about where someone may or may not fit, please reach out to me. Uh, those awards are open for nomination until Friday, so it's a pretty quick turnaround. And then this is the 2022 logo, but stay tuned for the local SMART Awards. These are our city and county focused awards programs. Uh, similar idea, people, projects in these communities that are worth uh, noticing, let us know about them, nominate them for an award, and, and hopefully they'll get recognized. And that's it, that's me. Uh, this, I don't know about the security of this QR code, uh, <laughs> but I do know that it goes to an app called Hi Hello. I have no idea if it's a good app, but I don't have business cards anymore. So that's the best way to get my contact information. Uh, these are our two sites. This is my email. This is, a, a I think, a social thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of on Twitter, but not really. So uh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> so I work in PR, so I'm B2B PR to be Oh, great. So it was very funny to hear you talk about Sorry. B2B. No, no, I'm not offended. It's true. They're very niche. Um, but. I was kind of curious, like, so, like you said, you only know, like, what people tell you about, no. um, obviously you do research too, but, for instance, like, like, we've got the Joels of the world at Cook County yeah. who are ready and they know that they can come and talk to you. How do you, like, tell people in maybe, like, a more rural place um, that they, too, can send you tips and things like that? It's, it's a good question. Uh, the, the shortest answer is that I like to do things like this. I know this is not a rural place but it's getting out in that community, making sure that people understand what you do. One of the things that I've done everywhere that I've lived uh, is that I've gone and met with the IT leaders in, in all of those places. Uh, I, I live in Urbana, you know, the State Scoop audience probably doesn't know about Urbana, uh, but I've gotten to know the CIO of Urbana and the CIO of Champaign uh, relatively well. And, and the goal of that is, again, for me to come up here and say these things, which you know are kind of lofty ideas in hope, hopes to get to education or uh, uh, execution, uh, you know, you have to build those communities, you have to build those relationships. And so the, the number one best way to do it is just to get to them in person and just talk to them as much as you can. Uh, if you can't, you know, I, I hope and, and I, I work every day to make sure that our content and our information is as accessible and visible as possible to people, whether you're the governor of California or the you know, the mayor slash IT person slash police officer of a town of 500 people. Um, and so we wanna be reachable, we wanna be visible, we want that 
that content, whether it's about VoIP phones in Cook County or something else, to, to be understandable to a, a very wide audience. Again, it's, it's sort of like we're a B2B publication cosplaying as a community newspaper, and we're sort of hoping that people figure it out. And, but but I, if you have ideas, I, I'm certainly open to them and, and want to do better at that. It's hugely important to us. Uh, you know, the, the size doesn't matter. It's more about getting to the people. Did that answer it a little bit? Yeah, no, that's OK. Cool. <laughs> sure. So I have a question about when you have a source and they tell you something, and then how do you decide? And they're like, oh, like you don't want to go public or whatever. But it's in the community's best interest to be the knowledge we share. Like, I know that's sort of an ethics question probably yeah. that you have to wrestle with, but how do you know when the greatest good is for it? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the big part of that is just being plugged into the community itself. So being a part of it, again, not being a, a, a bystander, but being in the community, being with people, knowing people's thoughts and feelings about what's happening, I think that's a big part of it. That, that helps you with some of that stuff. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we, we are taught in journalism this set of rules, right? So like off the record means it just can't go anywhere. You can't tell any, it's like, it's like you're the CIA and you have this great secret that you can't tell anyone. Um, and so our job then becomes how can we get that confirmed either by that person telling us on the record or by finding a way to that story outside of that. And so that could be like, you know, hey, you know, I heard, uh, I heard Chicago is going to move their IT department. Is there anything going on there? Mm -hmm. And just seeing if other people who might know about this will tell that story uh, and, and following it down. But at the end of the day, the number one thing is just making sure that whatever we're talking about is right and that it is true. Um, and, you know, <laughs> there, there's a, you have to be pretty high profile for a he said, she said uh, to, to be a story. Uh, so so you, you just have to keep vetting things and, and researching and getting to know the community, getting to know the sources, and making sure that at the end of the day, what you're publishing, what you're hearing is true. I, I, I will tell you <laughs> that I talk about being accessible and reachable, and that's true, but I also hear a lot of things every day that are so not true of people who are just saying like, oh, this, this thing happened. It's like, ah, all right, and then I make some calls. And it's not, 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 not true. So, so, so that's part of it is just making sure that these things are true and, and getting to the bottom of it as, as best you can. Did that answer the question? Maybe not. Yeah, well, I just, I'm, journalists are rock stars to me, so I Oh, I appreciate that, yeah. Question. I, I, that's a nice thing to say. I think we can do better. I think we need to keep doing better, journalists. Uh, I, I appreciate the respect that, that we get, but I, I think, that the, the minute we, we, we tune out and, and think that journalists are doing the work for us, uh, I think we, we, we lose touch a little bit. So I would just encourage you to not just trust journalists, but stay engaged with them and, and make sure that they're uh, aware of and representing your community's best interests. Uh, just to follow up, like, how do you tackle like, the problem of like, anonymity or anonymity? Yeah. yeah. So each publication has its own rules on, on what, your, uh, you know, what the rules are gonna be about how how public you can be about uh, an unnamed source. We typically don't do a lot with unnamed sources because it is in our community's best interest, to your point, to get the story out there. And so it would have to be a pretty big deal for, for us to publish something with an unnamed source. But I'm not gonna say it won't happen, uh, but, but we have some pretty strict standards about it. Uh, it has to be verifiable multiple times by multiple people. Uh, and we have to know that this story it obviously is essential for the community, uh, but but that it you know that things will change or, or or be responsive to this content getting out. Is that a, good? Yeah. You say you're a staff of four. Yes. So uh, since you're covering like basically the whole the whole country and there's like thousands of municipalities, and yeah. How do you decide what to focus on or what your scope is? So the scope is is what I said at the beginning. We have that the all all fifty states uh, central IT departments top 20 cities by population, top 10 counties by population. So that's sort of our, our guiding principles. Um, but again, you know, that, that actually, that very idea is a contradiction of what I'm saying, right? It's exclusionary, right? So uh, one of those, one of the big things that we do is make sure that if there's a novel story that's happening, if there's something happening in a town of 500 or a town of 80 uh, that is interesting and that is important for this community to know about, again, as members of this community, we're, we're not restricted by telling those things. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out how we're gonna spend our time every day. And so that's why we have these sort of guidelines of where we focus, but 
we're always on the lookout for things that we might not know about. I guess my point was like, even that is a pretty big scope. Yeah. So do you find it a challenge? It, it, I mean, it's certainly challenging. Uh, it, it helps a little bit that we are focused on technology, right? So like, think about there are all these thousands of municipalities, 50 states and all that, uh, but then we're focused on one thing within that and even, even deeper, you know, our core focus right now is sort of that IT side of the house. It's something that a CIO, a CTO, a CISO would care about, not necessarily everything techno technological. I think that's the vision. I think we'd like to be able to be that. Um, but, but at the moment, we sort of have these pretty restrictive ideas. Again, we're serving our specific community that we have right now, and that sort of keeps us in check. Uh, I got a question just more generally about your coverage. I'm yeah. just kind of curious, since you've seen a lot, you've been covering this for a while, are there, you know, I've been, obviously I'm like on the outside, so I've like been kind of like watching stuff as it's been coming in, but, you know, are there big trends, like a few big things you've seen changing over time? I mean, civic tech was a big thing, and, and, and maybe that's like a little bit like less of a bigger like yeah. national story. Uh, what are some of those big themes you're kind of seeing? Like, yeah. I'm just kind of curious. The, the two biggest ones right now in, in all of the communities that we cover uh, is cybersecurity and workforce. So, you know, I think that especially governments, but higher education as well, having a huge problem recruiting and retaining uh, technological talent to do these jobs. Um, and it's kind of at a point where it's, it's actually terrifying, if you think about it, because you have, uh, you know, there are several large, in that, in that top 25 by population cities, uh, there are several large cities in that group that have one person, maybe, devoted to cybersecurity meaning all of your data is potentially vulnerable. So it's, it, the, the workforce thing is, is huge, and, and it's not just about cybersecurity, it's about every, every technological facet inside of government. Workforce is, is really, really, really important. Cybersecurity, obviously, the stakes are very, very high. Uh, you know, I think, I think for me, a couple of things that I've noticed over the years, one is sort of the rise and fall of smart cities. You guys know this, smart cities? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, smart cities, the, the, it was the best thing that never happened. Uh, everyone talked about it, it was huge. And, and the, the reality is that, that smart cities is happening, right? The principles that were inherent in that idea are now being ingrained in government. Uh, but it's not this big showy, you know, IoT driven, uh, you know, AI Terminator hellscape that we kind of thought it was going to be. Uh, it's now just sort of how cities are operating because they have to because of all the challenges that I'm talking about. So smart cities is one. And then I would say, you know, for me, and this is, this is kind of my nerdiest, uh, just IT modernization is kind of the coolest stuff in the entire world, which I know sounds ridiculous, but uh, most of everything that, we, that a government does is kind of hanging on by maybe one LAN cable. Like it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Uh, and so there's a lot of money. I, we just did a story a couple weeks ago about the CIO of South Dakota, uh, again, big old state, uh, going in before their legislature and saying, hey, uh, we need $70 million to make sure that people can continue to get paid because this system could go down tomorrow. And that's pretty massive. Again, these are this, the types of stories that, uh, you know, government's been using technology for so many decades, and a lot of that technology is still the way it was. Uh, as of just a couple of years ago, and forgive me for not being fully aware of this, uh, the state of Illinois' uh, enterprise resource planning effort uh, was rooted in the 60s. I know that they've been modernizing it, uh, but I don't think it's done, <laughs> and it's 2023. So you have systems that are 30, 40 years old that are, are driving uh, how well or how not well government is functioning, and uh, you know every time one of those fails, it's a national news story. Uh, you saw that during the pandemic. A a almost every state's unemployment insurance system failed. That was an IT modernization pro problem. It was just that the system was not ready for demand. If it had, as simply as if it had just been in the cloud, it could have scaled up. Instead, it was on a mainframe, and so it collapsed, and it took days to get back online. So these are things that are really, really, really important uh, that, that I think you know, are, are, are bigger than just trends. It's more you know, crisis level issues. <laughs> yeah, was that helpful? Yeah. Okay. I'm seeking all this validation every time I, I answer a question. Yeah. I actually have an uh, audience, uh, live stream okay. audience question. Let's, might piggyback a little bit on what you were just talking about, um, but it says, so many government initiatives have an IT component. How do you decide how big a part of the story tech is and whether or not it merits a story? 
That's a great question. Uh, so, you know, 10 years ago, my answer would have been, oh my goodness, anytime. Anytime there's an IT component, we're gonna write that story. Uh, now, IT is a part of everything in government, right? So uh, every, pick a national news story that government's working on and there's an IT component if you look hard enough. And so uh, we, we do that through the classic journalism methods of, of sort of what, what makes news. So timeliness, how, how pressing is this? Uh, impact, how big is the scale of this, right? How, how many people are gonna be affected? How much money is involved? Um, uh, novelty. Is there something really weird about this that doesn't jive with anything else? Uh, and we just sort of make those calls. And ultimately, that's another reason why we need community and why we need responsive uh, or responses from the folks that, that we cover and, and who read our stuff uh, is because I want to know, you know, hey, that story that we wrote about, you know, uh, Nebraska thinking about blockchain for a second, uh, was that interesting to you or, or would you rather have me use that, that time somewhere else? Uh, and so, you know, there's that classic journalism mentality of, of what is news and, and, and diving into that, but also being responsive to and listening to your community when they tell you what they want uh, out of that content. And I can't give validation from that, they're on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, do you cover um, K-12 education because they're run by, okay. Cause yeah. uh, a little bit, a little bit. So, so admittedly, uh, it sh probably should be its own publication um, because, and then there are, there are a couple great publications covering K through 12 out there, um, but it's massive. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really challenging. And this is, you know, a, a wider challenge when we think about community news is because K through 12 falls under the bounds, mostly almost always of a government somewhere. Uh, but the community itself couldn't be more different. Uh, the, the education environment operates completely different than a government operation, other than there's bureaucracy, right? That's about the only thing that they have in common. <laughs> uh, but you have, you know, like in a school, in a K through 12 district, your chief technology officer might also be your librarian. In a state government, your chief technology officer is, you know, an IT bureaucrat that comes to work every day in an IT office. There, there are definitely similarities. I'm not saying that there, there are not. I, I've spent some time covering K through 12, uh, and and certainly have plugged in with a bunch of organizations that are focused on K through 12 CIOs and CTOs. Um, but you know, the the there, there are a lot of differences as well that I think make it harder. So I think to be truly responsible for for covering that, I think you need its own. It, it needs its own thing, um, and I would encourage you to demand that I build that <laughs> uh, or to do it, you know, to, to find the, the sources yourself. Cause I think it's really, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and, and talk about everything that we cover on state scoop every day, the things that K through 12 that's happening in K through 12 right now are going to demand the future of what that is. And so it's, it's hugely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ransomware is a big problem in K through 12 that we do cover a lot of, uh, because there, there's just, you know, when a small, district of 2,000 people gets hit with ransomware, uh, all that student data, all that very, very personal data on kids uh, is accessible and visible, and, and it's really dangerous. How are you funded? How are we funded? Uh, so we, we, ha we are for-profit, so we have revenue. Again, about 80% of our revenue comes from events that we host and convenings of people. Um, but we have digital advertising, we have uh, a couple of other different products that, that we offer, but at the end of the day, our, our our, sorry, uh, our business model is designed so that we can protect the content itself and protect the people uh, in our community. And so we're very restrictive about what, when people spend money with us, what that means for them. Uh, and and we, we try our best to make sure that the people in our community are, are safe from vendors. <laughs> One of the big things is, you know, we'll host an event and uh, every single tech company in the world will want to talk to our speakers and we want to make sure that they have uh, you know, some rules of the road of how that's going to be engaged. And so we do our best to protect that. Who are your biggest financial contributors? So again, we're, our, our clients are the biggest tech companies in the world. Uh, so IBM, Google, you know, all those, the, the big tech companies, Microsoft is another one. Um, but, but again, they're, they don't contribute directly to the product. Uh, everything is walled off from the, uh, from the vendor side of the house. So I can give you more details on that if you'd be interested. Yeah, both of you, because I know your questions are quite similar. So happy to tell you more. Yeah. Maybe there's time for one more audience question if, if one is there, but uh, I think somebody on the live stream just wanted to confirm 
if uh, where's the best place to give feedback? Could that be your contact information there or somewhere on the website? Probably just reach out directly to me. Um, that's 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 the easiest way I would say. Um, and it, you know, I, I I pride myself in my email management, so. Hopefully, if you email me, uh, it'll get through me really, really fast. Uh, but you know, I'm also available on social. I'm available. Uh, my phone number is on that QR code. So if you scan it and want to call me, you can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.